So Sigma recently released their classic 70mm macro, like this one for the Sony E-mount, alongside a whole bunch of other lenses for the Sony E-mount. They've also released it for Canon and Nikon, but this time it's an art lens. So today we're going to do a quick review of this lens, see how it stacks up against the Canon version, and also see how it fares against Sony's own 90mm macro G. Let's get undone. What is happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and today I've got three macro lenses for us to take a look at. But first, I want to give a quick thank you to Camera Canada for supplying me with these lenses so I could make this video. So make sure you check out their links in the description below. So I've had a bit of time to test these lenses already, and I can say, surprisingly, there is a clear winner in terms of which lens is actually best. But it's a tough decision on which lens to buy, and we'll get into that in a minute. But first, let's start off with something easy and just talk about what you get in the box. So with the Sigma, you get the basic stuff. You know, same classic white box you get for all the art lenses. Right on the box, it advertises that you get a seven-year warranty, which is a lot more than what you get with most manufacturers of the Sony, for instance, is only one year. So that's a consideration to make. Inside the box, you get all the usual garb. You get the warranty information, manual, and then you also get their bag, the sort of classic Sigma bag, the soft pouch. And, uh, you know, it's, it's decent. If you've ever had anything from Sigma before, this is what you'll expect to get. It's foam top, it's got like a sort of duffel bag kind of feel to it, and a decent little zipper. Stores your lens. Okie dokie. Sony lens is mostly the same, other than the fact that the box is orange. Uh, pop it open, and uh, inside you get a little bit better of a bag. Let's have a look at it here, I'll show you. So comes in bubble wrap. And then the bag, which a lot of the like G and G Master uh, lenses have, you know, nice bags with. This one's sort of a, a really nice leather drawstring, you know, high quality kind of tote that, uh, whoo, it's got a really strong kind of sawdust smell on the inside, but uh, it's a nicer bag. That's the only real differences in terms of the unboxing. Moving on to the lenses themselves, they're about a similar weight. The Sigmas are a bit denser because the Sony's a little bit larger, so I expected it to be heavier, but they feel like they're about the same weight. The construction is great on all three. Sony has a couple more features that we'll talk about in a second, but they all feel really solid and really great. The Sigmas have their classic rubber focus ring, where the Sony has more of a gridded metal focus ring. A quick note on the weather sealing, the Sony doesn't really have much in the way of weather sealing at all, where the Sigma for Sony has a little bit better, there's a, a bit of a gasket that runs around the outside, you, it's a little bit tactile. And then the Canon, surprisingly, has the best weather sealing of all, the Sigma for Canon. It seems to have a rather noticeable high-lipped gasket that runs all the way around and is you know, quite thick. So if I had to rank them in terms of weather sealing, I would go Sigma for Canon, Sigma for Sony, and then the Sony 90mm native. All three lenses have the same three-way selector for focusing distance with full, infinity to half a meter, and then half a meter to their closest focusing distance. Now the Sony really starts to break away from the Sigma here when it comes to a couple extra features and functions that were added to it that I really like. The first is a pretty basic one. It has a lens function button on it, which a lot of the G-class lenses do. And then the second thing is this great manual focus clutch that you engage just by sliding the focus ring up and down. And when it's engaged, it overrides the automatic focus in the manual and gives you hard stops on the focus ring. So you really know where you are in the focusing. And then to double that down, they've also added a gauge here, which lets you not only the magnification ratio that you're on, but also the focusing distance. This is a great feature for a macro lens to have. Plus it's really fun to use. Also one of the features that's only included on the Sony and not on the Sigmas is the ability to engage the stabilizer, the optical steady shot, which is why the lens is the macro G. OSS. Now often you'll pay quite a bit more and it's a, a sought after feature to have image stabilization and I think for the fact that this is a 90 millimeter macro image stabilization is a, a handy feature to have. Now I want to talk a little bit more about that difference in focal length the 90 millimeter on the Sony versus the 70 millimeter on the Sigma because this is going to come into play in determining which lens to actually buy and we're going to explain that a little bit with some tests on the focusing system because there's some things that I really want to show you because I can't do it until I actually power this lens on but as you can tell with the Sigma, there is no indicator as to what your magnification level is or anything about your focusing on the outside of the lens. You actually have to engage it because there's an extending barrel that comes out that has all the information on it. So that 
extra length coupled with the shorter focal length is going to make a difference in terms of your usage situation for which these lenses is going to be best suited for. So just before we jump over into the focusing tests, I want to give you a quick little note on why the magnification ratio is important for those of you out there that don't shoot a lot of macro. So when it comes to macro lenses, uh, a, a true macro lens should be able to achieve a one to one ratio. And this is always achieved at the lens's closest possible focusing distance. So when you have the lens at exactly the closest distance you can get to the subject while still being in focus, that's your closest or your minimum focusing distance. And they're usually written on the lens somewhere. For instance, this one's right here. It says 0.28 meters or 0.92 feet. Now that goes by the focal plane mark that is indicated usually on the top of your camera body. So from that mark, to the actual plane of focus that you're taking, so like the, you know, the flower petal that you're trying to get in focus, that distance, when you're at your closest focusing distance with a macro lens, that's when you will achieve one-to-one -one magnification, and that's kind of like your ideal macro distance. That's why 90 millimeters is probably a little bit better than 70 millimeters in some usage scenarios, because you can achieve your one-to-one -one magnification while being a little bit further away. So think that if you were approaching some kind of timid creature that you wanted to get a macro shot of, the further away that you can stay, the more, the less likely you are to spook them. So for that usage case, the 90 millimeter allows you to get 0.28 meters or 0.92 feet, where the 70 millimeter is 0.258 meters. So you have to get just a little bit closer. But now we're gonna talk about how you have to get even closer still because of the extending barrel of the Sigma. So let's plug this into the camera and turn it on and then you can see what I mean. So now that the barrel is extended, you can see the magnification ratio, the focusing distance in feet and in meters like I was saying earlier. So the information is still there and although you can still set it to one to one manually, you don't actually get to see where you're going until after it extends, where on the Sony it's just all visible there for you and you can just turn it until you find the hard stop that you want. Now one thing I noticed right away about the Sigma was how much noisier it is than the Sony. As soon as you start focusing with it, it makes this constant churning sound, which uh, can obviously be a bit of a problem, again, in that scenario where if you're out, you know, wildlife and you don't want to spook something, it actually makes quite a bit of noise. So do you see what I mean now about how it's pretty noisy and you can constantly hear it kind of ee, 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 going in and out like that? I think you'll see a significant difference when we put the Sony on. So let's throw the Sony 90 millimeter on there now. And I want you to look for two things. Uh, I want you to hear for the difference in the focusing sound, but also see how much further away we can have the furthest point the furthest sort of object of our camera from the subject in order to achieve the same image. So as you saw, well I guess heard, the Sony is near silent and I really, really enjoy the AF-MF clutch that they have here. I, I like that it's so much faster to get into manual focus override and I really like the hard stop on the one-to-one -one ratio there. So if you want to just do it manually, you can just lock it into MF, switch it to one-to-one -one, and then just get a little bit closer until you find yourself in focus take the shot, now you know you're getting that one-to-one -one ratio. The Canon version of the Sigma performs mostly the same way as the Sony version of the Sigma does, but there are a couple of little differences in the quirks that I should point out. The Canon one, when you shut it off, it doesn't automatically sort of retract the barrel, where the Sony one does, as soon as you turn it off, that goes back inside. So you have to turn it on, and then you can pull it in. But the advantage that the Canon has in this is that you can always manually override, regardless of what setting you're on. But with the Sony, you have to engage the DMF mode or manual focus mode in order to actually override. The Canon does have the MF switch, but you don't need to engage it in order to actually manually override the lens. The Canon model did focus a little bit more slowly and a little bit less reliably than the Sony model, but that could be for a few reasons. This is an older Canon. This is a 5D Mark III, where the Sony is a brand new a7 III. So I think that it's probably more reflective on the bodies than it is on the lenses themselves. But it does go to show that despite people having complaints about the Sony versions just sort of being like longer versions of the Canon ones, they do actually capitalize on Sony's very fast autofocus. All right, now let's take a look at the images that we captured. We'll open up in Lightroom and we'll do a little comparison to see how the Sigma stacks up image quality wise compared to the Sony.
With the Sony, I expected it to be a little bit better, but I did not expect it to be essentially silent. And then also, like I was saying, because the Sigma has an extending barrel and the Sony does everything internally, not only is the Sony near silent, but uh, the center of balance doesn't change at all. And you always have sort of the same sort of familiarity with how long your lens is going to be, which is going to affect your ability to be stable. So that coupled with the included stabilizer on the lens, the lens function button, the brilliant manual focus clutch, the, the Sony lens is just far and away sort of better made than the Sigma. That's not to say that the Sigma is bad, it's just that it's a different thing. But all of these benefits definitely come at a cost with the Sony being almost twice as much as the Sigma. So it's going to be more of a usage case where you decide which is going to be used where and whether or not you should spend the money all the way for the Sony. And I think this can be decided with basically just sort of two questions. One, are you going to be taking a lot of pictures of creatures that might be alarmed by you extending a barrel in their face or making a bunch of noise? If so, and you want to do that reliably and you like to do it a lot, the Sony is definitely worth the extra money even though it is twice as much. Also, I think in video, if you're planning on doing any kind of macro video, and I know this isn't really a common thing, but if you wanted to do video with this lens, I think the ability for it to be silent while filming is going to be much more beneficial because I think this lens will basically just monkey up any video you were going to do if you have this thing focusing at the time. Now the Sigma on the other hand I think actually does have a place even though it sounds like I was just ripping on it. I still think it's great. The image quality is great. The build quality is still good. It has a little bit of weather sealing. It's got a seven year warranty. I mean this lens is great and coming in at its price point of $800 Canadian is is also great. The only thing that I would say about it is obviously the limitation on you know being out in the wild and making noise or doing something on a video or spooking the creatures but if you're in a studio setting or if you're doing product photography with macro or even if you're just out taking photos of plants where a little bit of noise and your distances and that kind of stuff doesn't really matter this is a great solution for half the price and and I would say that you you know yeah you're gonna lack that little manual focus clutch and stuff like that but but it's it's still a great great lens great. but the Sony is really the only option if you meet one of those other scenarios where you want to do video or you want to do creature macro photography or if you just, you know, if the money thing really isn't an issue and you just want to get the best one, the Sony is definitely the best one in this category. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>